What are injection attacks and injection vulnerabilities? This is the third most common vulnerability that we see out there in the wild according to OWASP. And in this video, I'm gonna explain exactly what they are. I'm gonna show you how you can run SQL injection, code injection, or cross-site scripting attacks. You just have to promise you won't use it for evil. And we're also gonna to talk to some breaches that happened because of it and what we can do to prevent this type of injection vulnerabilities in our own application. Before we get into it, please do me a quick favor, like this video, subscribe to the channel. I hate saying it, you hate hearing it, but it actually helps, so please do it. All right, enough about that, let's get into the video. What is injection? Now, probably you've heard of something like SQL injection, but there's lots of different types of injection attacks, but they all follow the same principle. You have an input field on a website that's expecting text, it's expecting language. And instead, we're gonna put code in there. And that code is aimed to do malicious things, steal information, disrupt the server, bypass authentication, whatever it may be. I wanna start just straight away by giving you an example of SQL injection. SQL injection you've probably already heard of, but we can explain all the principles of kind of general injection with SQL injection. So we'll start here and we'll move up to kind of more sophisticated attacks later. I have here a banking website called El Toro Mutual, right? Because who doesn't like to try and hack a bank every now and again? And we have a login screen. Now this is like very typical. You need a username and you need a password and you log in. And if I try and log in here, let's say I want to use the username admin, I'm going to come up with some password, it's going to give me an error. Before we run our injection attack, our SQL injection attack, let's have a look at what's happening behind the scenes. What is happening is this bank is running a query through, it, through its SQL database. It's saying, hey, select star, which means all, from users, the column of the database, where the username equals my user input and the password also equals my, my password input, right? Let's start off by the most simple kind of indication that there's a, an injection attack. I'm gonna put a single quotation point and username. And then I'm just gonna come up with some random uh, password. And what you'll notice is I get an error, but this error is different. I get a syntax error. What does that mean? It means that the query isn't now complete. It's, it's confused. Now this is good. This is the biggest indication that you have that there's an SQL injection vulnerability that I can run. So this is good news. Well, at least for an attacker. So why has this happened? Why have I confused the query now? Well, if you look back at the query, the user input and the password input are surrounded by those quotation points. It's saying, hey, this is where the input starts, this is where the input ends. And if I add another one in, well now the whole thing's weird. Where does the input start? Where does it finish? What's this other single quotation point doing? What I can do is I can put a single quotation point in here and then I can add code after it. And the query will run as if that code I've injected is actually part of the original kind of query that it's meant to run. So this means I can do nefarious stuff. Now, it's pretty obvious in a login page what I want it to do. I'm gonna put in the username and I want it to ignore the fact that I need a password. So how do I do that? I'm gonna put in the username admin and then at the end of that, I'm putting my single quotation mark, right? I'm saying, hey, this admin part, this is the end of the user input. I'm now gonna put double dash here. Why double dash? In all coding, we can add comments to it, right? In Python, it's hash and this allows you to explain, you know, explain your code. SQL is dash dash. I'm essentially saying the username is admin and dash dash, everything past this is now just to be ignored. So where it says, and make sure the password matches, I'm ignoring it. If I look at the query, this is what it looks like now. I can add anything I want in the password field. I'm just gonna put one and I'm gonna log in. And as you can see, I can now log in as the admin user. This is an authentication bypass via SQL injection. And in fact, it doesn't stop there. There's heaps of different payloads that you can find for SQL injection, but the principles are all the same. I wanna disrupt the query. I wanna inject my own code after there, and I want it to do malicious stuff. So now we understand SQL injection. Let's move on to a different type of injection. Let's move on to code injection, right? This is the exact same principle. There's a user input. What do we do with user inputs? We try and put code in there and we try and break stuff. That's what we do. All right, so let's look at a different website. Now we're looking at a retirement savings website. This is letting me know how much money I've got in savings. I'm doing pretty well. I've got $89,000 here, right? So now I've logged in, but let's say I'm logged in and I'm kind of malicious. So I'm gonna go and I'm gonna click onto one of these fields and you see there's lots of inputs here. So I say it's here, new payroll con contribution. I can put in a number. That's what it's expecting. However, 
why don't I put in code and see what happens? And this is a node a JavaScript application, and I can kill a process with a command that says process.kill, right? And then I can put in the type of process that I want to kill. I'm trying to destroy something in the website. So here I'm going to put in process.kill, process.pid. And if I run that, what happens? Well, it looks like nothing, but actually the whole website's gone down. If I try and reload the page, go back, it's gone down. I've killed the server because I've used this command. I've killed this process. And because they didn't protect these fields, I'm able to do that. I'm able to put in code that's going to kill things in the application, cause absolute havoc. Code injection, of course, can be lots of fun, but it is a little bit limited in the sense that sometimes even if you can successfully inject code, data or other areas are protected and you can't access you know, other people's information. That's what you want. But in walks cross-site scripting or XSS, and this can be a lot of fun. The principles are all the same as the other injection attacks we've talked about. You have an input field, untrusted data, and you try and put code in there. But with cross-site scripting, there's a very big difference. You have an attacker's server or an attacker's website. And what this website is trying to do is gathering information from different users. With cross-site scripting, one of the things that you're trying to do is permanently inject code into a website. Now, the most common area of this is something like a comment field. If you can inject code into that comment field, every time someone reads that comment, that code will run. And it can send information to a different website, a different server. And this can be absolutely devastating. So should we do a demonstration of cross-site scripting? Uh, absolutely, of course we should. Right up on my screen, you're gonna see two websites. One is my attacker's website, and one is my kind of vulnerable website. So the vulnerable website is kind of, we're pretending this is a streaming site, but there's a functionality in the streaming site that it has where you can add a review. And these reviews are public. And the other one is obviously my attacker's site. So what I'm gonna do is, first of all, let's just add a review, check that it works, right? Add a review and yeah, we see the review come down there in the bottom. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in here a malicious script. And what this script is going to do, it's going to call my malicious site, and it's actually going to steal information, and we're going to see it, that information is going to get posted on this malicious site. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a review. I'm going to say this movie is absolutely terrible. But then afterwards, I'm going to inject a script. You can see that script here. And you can see in the script, I'm calling my malicious site. Now, obviously this is local host. I'm hosting this on my computer, but you can just imagine this is any URL, right? Now, when I post that, what you'll see is you'll see the first part of that, but you won't see the script part in the reviews down the bottom. Oh, and this is really sneaky. And that is because I've now injected the script onto the site for everyone. And anytime someone goes to this site, that script will run. So what is that script doing? That script is stealing cookies or session tokens. We're diving into a different area now, but with session tokens, all oh, this is lots of fun. You know when you log into a website one day and you come back the next day and you don't need to log in again? That's because it saved a session cookie or a session token on your computer. That means that, hey, this computer is trusted. It's gone through the rigmarole and we can do it. If I steal that token from your computer, I can impersonate you. I can log in as you. And this is way better than finding a password. Why? Because I can bypass MFA. I can bypass all these other kind of protections that you have because according to the system, I'm already trusted. And that is what the script is doing. Every time someone goes onto this page, that script is going to run in the background. No one's going to be aware of it. And I'm going to steal their session cookie. And you can see on the attacker's site, this here, this gobbledygook, this is that session cookie. So this is a cross-site scripting attack. Do we see these types of injection attacks out there in the wild, in real life? We absolutely do. This used to be the number one application vulnerability that we had, but it's moved down to number three, primarily because it became so prominent that people had to start doing something about it. But that doesn't mean to say it's irrelevant. There's lots of attacks. Recently, back in 2003, there was a massive one by a company called Move It, a file transfer. And this actually brought down some airlines temporarily, and it was an SQL injection attack. Also, FreePick had an SQL injection vulnerability in it. I'm gonna talk about a different style attack because this is kind of unique to this type of vulnerability. The breach that I'm talking about is from a hacking group or a hacking gang, if you will, called Resume Looters. And what they did is they did an automated injection style attack across hundreds of sites. 
As a result of this attack, they managed to compromise 65 different websites and gain huge amounts of information, personal data, sensitive data from these sites. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because this attack was automated and it's something which is both kind of a, a power and a massive flaw in injection attacks. And that is that they're easily automated, right? What do you need? You need an input field and you need a payload list. You can automate that. Now, why do I say that this is also kind of like a power of injection? Well, we can actually easily discover them through the same means. So using something like DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing, this is basically a tool that acts like a hacker and will basically run attacks like this on your own website. So they can be quite simple for you to be able to figure out as well. So how do we prevent these injection style attacks? Well, of course, there's numerous different methods. One of the primary ways is server-side input validation. And really this is making sure that the user input, the untrusted input meets what we're expecting. One tip with input validation is to prioritize allow list over ban list. And allow list means that you can only allow these characters. And if you try and do a ban list and the list gets so long and you're always gonna miss some and it gives attackers opportunities. If you do have a text field, that you want to allow code, then you want to implement something called escaping. And this is basically transferring any dangerous characters that could be interpreted as code and making sure that the function knows to treat them as strings. Usually this means putting a backslash next to them and there's lots of different functions that can do this. It can also mean sometimes transferring a character into its symbol entity. An SQL injection specific prevention is making sure that you use prepared statements. This means that you set up your query earlier on in your code with placeholders for the data and the data is injected on later. It means that we can really define what is user data and we can't change the intent of the query. Injection attacks can actually get really sophisticated and quite hard to prevent or easy to make a mistake in your code that could allow an attacker opportunity. That's why I always recommend using an in-app firewall. This is a firewall that understands the context of your application and is able to intercept communication between areas like your database and understand if an injection attack is actually happening and block it if it does. I recommend Zen by Akito for an open source in-app firewall. There's also a commercial version. I'll give links to the open source project down below. If you want more tools that are going to help you find these types of injection vulnerabilities within your code, definitely consider SAST, Static Application Security Testing, DAS, Dynamic Application Security Testing. There's some open source tools down below, but I also recommend checking out the free version of Aikido, which you can set up and even check to see on the OWASP Top 10 where you are with injection vulnerabilities. Next week, we're going to be talking about insecure design. I'm going to show you how someone discovered an infinite money loop through Coinbase because of Coinbase's insecure design. So make sure you subscribe to the channel to be able to see that video when it comes out. And I hope to see you next time.